Okay. This morning we're going to talk about what will happen immediately after the rapture. We're going to start out in Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. And I've been over this passage a lot in my different messages on the pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, If you've heard those, uh, you're going to be familiar with this passage. If you haven't heard those messages, you know, I'd like to encourage you to listen to those because it explains in detail why the rapture will be before the tribulation begins. But here in chapter 4 of Revelation, John is actually caught up at the rapture that will be we will be experiencing in the future. And it says here, verse 1, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Notice it says, immediately. Okay? It says over in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now show me that in connection with the second advent. When Jesus Christ comes back, show me any kind of a catching up of saints into the clouds immediately, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's not there. What is this event then? It's something different. It's the rapture of the body of Christ. You know, the body of Christ is not going to go through seven years of God's wrath. That's ridiculous. But now for the Christian, what will happen immediately after this event? Okay, when the rapture happens, it's not going to be a slow kind of gradual thing where you start going up into the air and, and your unsaved relatives look over at you and, oh no, it's the rapture. We better get down on our knees quick and get saved and then we'll go up along with them. No, it's immediate. Bam and you're gone. There will be no chance to get saved at that point as far as I'm saved and I can go up in the rapture now. When the rapture hits, you're going to be going into that tribulation if you're not saved. There's not going to be any time to change your mind. But for the Christian, the rapture is going to hit. It's going to be very quick. It's going to be very startling. And then when you get up to heaven... We're going to be up there for that seven-year period, but we're not going to be just bored sitting up there, kind of, you know, sitting around, oh, what are we going to do? You know, boy, I can't wait to get back down to the earth for the millennial kingdom. There's going to be things happening in heaven for the Christian. And, of course, the first of those events, the big one, is the judgment seat of Christ, which is another study. We're not going to, you know, discuss that this morning. But 1 Corinthians 3, verses 12 through 15, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, and Romans 14, verse 10, talk about this judgment seat of Christ. And there your works are going to be tried by fire, and you will receive a reward, okay? And you're not going to be purified or something like that. No, it's a judgment of your works. Okay, You, as a Christian, if you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, then you are cleansed, your sins are gone, they're taken care of, in terms of eternal judgment. Okay, you're not going to go to hell because you've sinned or something. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses those sins. But what gets judged there at the judgment seat of Christ is what you have done. So it's not that, okay, now I'm a Christian, now I can sin. No, because that will show up at the judgment seat of Christ. And you'll see the things that you've done in this life being burned up. Okay, and that will be a pretty scary time for a lot of people. Uh, but then the other thing that's going to happen is, is uh, Revelation 19, verse 7 through 9. We're not going to turn there, but the marriage supper of the Lamb. You have to understand that as a Christian, you are the bride of Christ and you're also members of his body. Which is really kind of remarkable when you think about it. These people, Christians that teach that you're going to go through the tribulation. How is it that there are going to be two... If, if you believe that, that Christians go through the tribulation... Do you realize that that would mean that there are two Christs on the earth? The Antichrist and Jesus Christ? You know, when Paul, well, Saul at that point, when he was, when Jesus spoke to him on the road there, he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You know, did Paul ever persecute Jesus Christ himself? No, he persecuted Christians. But those Christians, Jesus said, you're persecuting me. 
See, it, it, it just, it's such a warped way of thinking that the body of Christ is going to go through the tribulation, especially when the body of Christ is clearly in heaven and it's God opening the seals and pouring out his wrath on the world. So he's pouring out wrath on himself <laughs> if you believe that Christians go through the tribulation. It's just ridiculous. But it's going to be kind of interesting, too. I often think about it. These people, Christians that don't believe in a, a pre-tribulation rapture, imagine what's going to go through their heads when they actually go through the rapture. <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, they'll hear their name come up hither. Blam! They're probably going to think, you know, oh, no, what happened? But the reality of it is, they're going to go up. Whether or not they believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they're leaving. <laughs> Sorry. I know you love the world and you want to prove how good a Christian you are, you know, going through the tribulation, fighting the Antichrist and everything. But at the rapture, if you're saved, you're leaving. Just the way it is. Okay, look at uh, chapter 3, verse 7. We're going to look at a contrast here between saved and lost. Okay, so the Christian goes up before the uh, tribulation. But let's look at the type of Christian here that God's going to keep from this time. Revelation chapter 3. Verse 7, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Now there's a couple things to notice here. Okay, first of all, this group of Christians, and, and you have to understand, the seven churches in the first three chapters there of Revelation. They are seven literal churches back in the first century that John is writing to. But they are also all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for re reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So instruction in righteousness is that these seven literal churches are also seven, you can say, church periods and also seven types of Christians. And here you have a type of Christian, I believe, that is symbolized by three things that you see there in verse 8. Okay, number one, notice it says, Thou hast a little strength. There's always going to be a remnant of Bible-believing Christians that do not compromise. The majority of Christians today, especially, are compromising. Just incredible how much compromising the average Christian does, how worldly they are. And it uh, reminds me of a verse in Isaiah 1 9. I'll read it here quick. It says, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. The reason that America has not totally been destroyed yet is because there's a small remnant of King James Bible believing Christians in this country that are not going to compromise. There are Christians in this country that know about Rome and they're never going to side with Roman Catholicism. They're never going to go with the new versions which come from the Roman Catholic manuscripts, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. I mean, the Alexandrian text. You can study that whole issue. They're not going to go with rock music because they know that the origins of that are satanic. There's a very small remnant of determined Bible-believing Christians in America that are not going to compromise. And that's the reason that God has preserved things for so long in this country. It's not because of the Constitution. It's not because of the Bill of Rights. It's because of Bible-believing Christians, that small little remnant. That's the only thing that's preserving this country. But then, number two, it says, and has kept my word and a verse that comes to mind there is John 14.23. says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You know, that's pretty phenomenal right there. 
Would you like to have God the Father and Jesus Christ making their abode with you? I mean, you know, they say you're a law-abiding citizen. Well, <laughs> is God abiding with you? Is God, do you walk with God? Well, what's the, what's the thing that you have to do to have that? Keep God's word. And how is it that these people out there can claim that they love Jesus Christ and yet use a Bible like the NIV which removes his name over 50 times? They remove the name of Jesus 50 times. The name God is taken out of the NIV over 500 times. I've done the collation. I, I can prove it. You know? I mean, you can study it. Contact me. I'll give you all the verse references. I mean, I, I love Jesus. Then why are you using an NIV? which can be traced back to the Roman Catholic Church and which attacks Jesus time and time and time again. See? And there's a lot of people that are that are ignorant of the subject. They don't know any better. I mean, I didn't know any better when I used an NIV, but I changed when I was shown the truth. Why wouldn't you change when you're shown the truth? Why would you say it's a non-issue? It's a big issue. And if you love Jesus Christ, you will keep His words. But see, that's the type of Christian that God will keep from the hour of temptation, which we'll get into here in a minute. But number three, number one, they have a little strength or a small group. Number two, they've kept God's word. And number three, has not denied my name. Matthew 10.32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also confess him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Verse 33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. And it's kind of interesting. I just watched a video on YouTube. Some of my friends over in England, ex-Catholics for Christ, and they actually went to this modern apostate church where they were handing out bottles of water. With John 3.16 on it. Oh, it's just such a nice, nice thing. And of course it wasn't King James Version. It was the NIV or something, the scripture on there. And the one guy, the one brother from Ex-Catholics for Christ, he said um, to this girl that was working at the stand, he said, uh, are you a Christian? Oh, yes, yes, I'm a Christian. You know. And he said, um, well, what exactly does it mean to be a Christian? And her face turned red, and she stumbled all around. Well, uh, uh, well, I, she could barely answer him. You know, and and well, I think it's just a, a belief in Jesus, and I think, and it was like she was ashamed to talk about Jesus Christ. And he said, "Well, you know, we believe that that you have to be born again. Are you born again?" And she just kind of stammered around. Well, um, I, 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 I think so. I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that. He... Huh? If somebody comes up to you and you can't tell them in ten seconds what it means to be born again, what it means to be a Christian, something's wrong. Something's very wrong. And a lot of these modern Christians, they'll talk all day long about the love of Jesus Christ, but they can't tell you how to get saved. They won't talk about sin or righteousness or judgment, which we're going to get into in a little bit. But, yeah, but, you know, the whole thing is there are Christians that are ashamed of Jesus Christ. The idea of handing out tracts or whatever is frightening to them. And they don't want anything to do with that. So this group of Philadelphian Christians, they're known for three things. They're a small group, they keep the word of God, and they're not ashamed of Jesus Christ. But then it says here um, in verse 10, it says that the, I will also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Now what is the hour of temptation? Well, that's a subject that you can debate back and forth and back and forth, and I've had a lot of thoughts and discussions on it. And, you know, part of it, I think, well, maybe the hour of temptation is where we're at right now, the great falling away, the great apostasy. Yeah, but it says there, uh, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Well, it doesn't really, you know, there are areas in the world right now where you can get away from the apostasy. You know, there are probably places out in the middle of nowhere that are not going to be affected by the modern new versions and the modern rock and roll churches. You know, I'm sure that there are Christians out there that probably have never even heard of some of that stuff in the backwoods areas if they don't have television, you know, or maybe over in China and things out in the mountains. 
I don't think that that hour of temptation is now. From praying about the thing and really looking at it, I think that the hour of temptation there is probably the time of Jacob's trouble, this great tribulation time period. From looking at it, looking at all the different angles, I think that that's probably the correct interpretation. So you have a Christian there, a Bible-believing Christian, a small remnant that's kept the word of God and is not ashamed of Jesus Christ, has not denied God's name, and they are the ones that are kept from the hour of temptation. But look at verse 11. It says, Behold, I come quickly. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. That's implied there that you can actually lose rewards. And I think that on, it's, it's, it just sickens me so much to see Christians who years ago they were King James Bible believing and that taking that stand is too difficult for them and so they drop it and they run off to some modern church somewhere because it's a lot more popular and there's a lot more programs for the kiddies and stuff like that and guess what's going to happen? They're going to lose crowns of reward because they did not endure to the end as far as their walk with the Lord. Okay, now I'm not saying you have to endure to the end to be saved. I'm not quoting Matthew 24. But the point is, remain faithful. If you are a Philadelphian type of Christian, if you're a King James Bible believer, and you realize that there aren't many of us around, and you have, you're not ashamed to tell people about Jesus Christ, stick it out. You know? Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. By the way, watch out for false prophets, because they're trying to take your crown. Okay, um, let's see. Now, what about the lost? You see the, a good type of Christian there. Now, I'm going to show you the, the majority of Christians, how they're described here by the Lord. Look at verse 14 there in Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> it says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Now there's a whole lot of stuff to look at here. But uh, this perfectly describes the majority of professing Christians today. Now, I believe that this modern church movement, um, I don't, well, I can say nobody here this morning came from a King James Bible believing Baptist church. All of us here this morning, everybody that I know of, came from the modern church movement. We came from the new version, the contemporary Christian music. We came from that background, all of us. Okay? So we were in that Laodicean church. And we came out of it. All right? So it's not that all the people in, in Laodicea there, all these types of Christians, nobody can get saved. It doesn't say that. But it's contrasted there. Verse 15 down through 18, you have lost people mentioned, or at least lost and they could be saved if they come out of it. But then 19 through 21, you have the ones that do come out. But now look at uh, verse 15 there. It says about they're neither cold nor hot. It's interesting because there are a lot of these modern Christians and they're very, they, they talk about being on fire for the Lord and I'm doing a lot for the Lord. You can do a lot for the Lord and be on fire, quote unquote, and be hot for the Lord, but doing it the wrong way. And it doesn't account for anything. You know, 
I mean, a lot of these modern Christians are very active at their big mega church thing. But they're doing it the wrong way. They're doing it by worldly compromise. So their on fire for the Lord's service is actually neither cold nor hot. And I, I, it, it's just amazing. When I see this thing, there was a, there's a video on Jack Chick's website right now. Some modern, I don't, I guess she's a, a contemporary Christian singer or I don't know what. You know, this good looking girl and stuff. And, and of course you got a bunch of girls sitting around in this multi-million dollar studio set. And they're all dressed in modestly, and you got these guys with the cool hip clothes on, you know, and the spiky hair and all this. And it it's like this, it looks like MTV or something. And it's supposed to be a Christian program. You know, and oh, they're talking boldly about Jesus Christ and everything. Yeah, but they look just like the world. They've taken the world's, com- the, the world's clothing and the wa- world's ways, and, and they talk like the world, look like the world, act like the world. See, they're neither cold nor hot. It's just like kind of right in the middle, you know, and just seeing it, it just, it makes me personally sick. And that's how you should feel as a Christian when you see that modern Christian, this modern Christian church movement, this entertainment, big, you know, impressing the world type of of thing. The world's not supposed to be impressed by us. The world is supposed to hate Christianity, you know, and of course you look at real true Christians, the ones that are out on the streets preaching the King James Bible believing Christians they are hated by the world they're trying to pass laws to you know hate crime laws and things and these modern Christians never have to worry about it I mean I remember I saw a program the one time I, th- I forget who it was the newsboys or I don't even know I've, I'm I've been out of that whole corrupt system for so long I don't know their names but one of the big contemporary Christian bands and they're signing deals with Chevy Motor Corporation. Chevy Motor Corporation is sponsoring their concerts, you know, and and they said we're, we're making a crossover album, in other words, secular, you know, and and one guy said, oh, we're not we're not going to forsake Jesus Christ, and one of the other band members laughed and he's like, oh, you sound like a fundamentalist, and they all started kind of like, ha ha ha, yeah, and I thought, you know what that is? It's disgusting. It's sick, and I can tell you right now. That's making God sick. When he looks down and he sees people who profess to be saved and yet they don't offend the world, the world looks up to them. The world plays their music. The world sponsors them, gives them money. Think about that. That's what's making God sick. And they're they're doing a lot of tours. You know, they're very active, but they're active in the wrong thing. You see? But it says there, verse 16... I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now, I've covered this more in the You Chose Jesus, but the Jesus Choose You message. I covered covered it more in detail about false converts. But if you, sorry to get graphic here, but if you spew something out of your mouth, what is it that came out of your mouth? Is it part of your body? No. It's foreign matter in your body. It's something that, Looked like it was part of the body, but all it is, it's just down there in the stomach. And the body rejected it, exactly. And that's what these modern Christians are, a lot of them. There's no repentance connected with their salvation. You know, it's kind of like they're walking on the, on the broad road that leads to destruction, and the Lord says, hey, would you like to get saved? And hands them a track, and they go, hey, that's really interesting. I like that. I'd like to do that. And the Lord says, yeah, but you're, you're still walking, you know, to hell. On the road to hell, you're still walking on the road to destruction. Well, yeah, but I think my testimony could be better to the unsaved world if I keep walking with them. You know, that's what they do. No, repentance comes when you get saved. Repentance means you turn and you go the opposite direction. And a lot of these people, oh, I can keep, I can look like the world, I can act like the world, I can be just like the world and be respected by the world and still be saved. No, you can't. No, you cannot. If your Savior, Jesus Christ, was hated by the world and crucified by the world, do you think that you're going to do any better than Him? No. It's repentance. It's turning. You have to leave that world system. Okay? But these people don't do that. They're neither cold nor hot. They compromise. That's what they do. So what are they? Well, they they know how to talk the talk. They'll profess Christ. They look like they're part of the body. 
But all they are is foreign matter. And I believe at the rapture, they're going to be spewed out. And I don't mean physically that they're going to go up to the clouds and all of a sudden back down. No, I think that they're going to be left here. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail here in just a minute. But now look at the... And of course you go down through verses 17 down through 18 and you see the modern Christian church. I mean, if you went back 200 years ago, you wouldn't see the big, huge, multi-million dollar church buildings with the pastor pulling in in his brand new Mercedes and you know private jets flying around and stuff. You wouldn't see that. That's not there. That's the things that Roman Catholics would have, would have been looking like, you know. But now we have Protestant popes all over this country, you know, Christians that control these empires, you know, two hundred acres of of land and most of its buildings, you know, and art galleries and and auditoriums and what is that? It's this right here, Laodicean. But look at verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. A true Christian will be rebuked and chastened. And I know of modern Christians that are in that modern church movement, and I've seen God rebuke and chasten them. And I know that they're saved. They're just, for some reason or another, they just they don't have the guts to come out and be a real true Bible believer. They, they count the cost. They know what it's going to cost them. They know that they're going to be mocked and made fun of, and they can't take it. So they cling to their modern church because they can't take the persecution that comes with being a Bible believer. Okay, And you watch those people. The true converts will be rebuked, and they will be chastened. But you see a lot of these modern Christians, and they're just prospering and having a wonderful time, and they're never rebuked. They're never chastened of the Lord. Why? Because they're not his kids. They're not his children. Okay, they know they know how to talk the talk, but they're not his children. They are the foreign matter in God's stomach that's going to be spewed out at the rapture. Um, but it says there, verse twenty: Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Remember, it said there, back in the verse I read previously about if you love Jesus, you'll keep his words. And they will, and and Jesus and the Father will come to you and make their abode with you. See, and there are Christians, and like I said, all of us here this morning came out of that modern church movement, but we had to do it individually. It wasn't, oh, glory to God, the whole church repented, and we all are now using King James Bibles, and we're all Bible believers, and we all went back to the old hymns, and oh, you know, no, not going to happen. We had to leave our big modern churches. You know, well, they're they're not about to to convert. You know, you if you're a Christian in some big modern church somewhere, don't be deceived into thinking that now that you've learned the truth, if you study the Bible version issue and you study the history of rock music and everything else in the Catholic Church and whatever, if you study that, don't be deceived into thinking that you're going to convert your whole church. It isn't going to happen. Okay, God is picking one here, one there. Hey, if if any man hear my voice, you want to come? Come unto me, you know? It's just going to be small peoples. Remember, it's a small remnant, the Philadelphian type of Christian. But now let's turn to Well, let me let me finish here, verse 21. Look at that quick. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and and am set down with my Father in his throne. The best reward out of all the seven types of Christians, if you look at the Bible that way, the best reward is for that Christian who's in the Laodicean period and comes out of that wicked modern church and becomes a Philadelphian type of Christian. They're the ones who get the best reward. You know, how hard would it have been to be a Christian and stand for the King James Bible a hundred years ago. Not very hard. You know, I stand for the King James Bible. Everybody would be like, yeah. <laughs> what else is there? Well, I heard some liberals up in New York are using the American Standard Version in 1901. Yeah, well, you know, that's up there. You would have walked into the average church a hundred years ago, and they would have all been King James Bible. And they would have all sung the old hymns, and they would have all been pretty conservative, you know. But today, 
Tuh. You think the average church is King James only? Wrong. Nope. They use anything but the King James Bible. And if they use the King James Bible, they'll tear it down. And they'll attack it. You know? But now let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10. And we're going to see exactly what's going to happen here. The rapture hits. Bloom. Blam. And all of a sudden these narrow-minded, bigoted, Bible-thumping, King James only, divisive <laughs> Christians, you know, all the names that we get called, we're gone. And all these modern apostates that never really truly were born again, that never repented, they're left here scratching their heads going, I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened there. Well, look at verse 10. <clears throat> And with all deceivableness of the unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. How is it that these people, let me just stop there for a minute, how is it that they can claim to be saved? Oh, I'm a Christian, but they don't have a love of the truth. They reject the truth. They hate the truth. Uh, that doesn't work. Verse 11, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. That comes in again. Verse 14, Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. They say, oh, you're stubborn. You're not willing to change. We're going to look at that in a minute here. I'm going to show you some New Age writings, read some things to you, where that's what they hate about Christianity. Oh, you stubborn Christians. You won't change. You won't keep with the times. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Verse 16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Do you have a King James Bible? Then you have the good word of God. And you need to be established in that thing. You need to know your Bible. That's what keeps you out of error. It's not by being a super spiritual person and loving Jesus and stuff and going around talking about love all the time. No, you need to know the Word of God. That's what will keep you from error. Okay, loving the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. Okay, this book is God's Word. Therefore, it is the greatest book of truth on the planet. Okay, that's the only way that you can stick with the Lord. <coughs> Okay, but now let's look at um, John chapter 16. We're going to be back here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in a little bit, but we'll go to John 16 for now. John chapter 16, verse 7. <clears> throat> throat's kind of giving out on me this morning here. <clears throat> no, I'll be fine. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. Is Jesus physically in the world right now? No. Then what do we have as a witness? The Comforter. Okay, now who is the Comforter? Well, he's the Holy Spirit. Verse 8. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay, now I want you to notice three things there. And this is so interesting. You're going to actually see this really ties in later. Just amazing. 
there are three marks of Holy Spirit possession. You know, a lot of the Pentecostal charismatics, they talk about, you know, do you have the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost? And then they say the baptism of, you know, the Holy Ghost and the speaking in unknown tongues and all this stuff. That's not it. The three marks of somebody who has the Holy Spirit is, number one, look up at uh, verse 8. He will reprove the world of sin. If you're saved and the Holy Spirit is in you, you will be against sin. And you will not be afraid to tell what sin is and be against it and talk to people about sin. Number two, of righteousness. You will be a different person. You will not look like the world and act like the world. There will be something different there. You should have righteousness. Okay, number three, judgment. Oh no, that's the worst one of all. You're judgmental? You're judging people? Oh, you can't do that. That's not that's not Christ like. <laughs> you know, yeah. Aha, uh -huh, sure. Those are the three marks of somebody who has the Holy Spirit. Reproof of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Okay, those three things must be present in the life of somebody that calls themselves a Christian. And if they're not there, they're not saved. I can tell you that. If they don't talk to people about sin, if there's no righteousness, if there's no separation from the world, and if there's no Man, God's going to judge this world. Man, that guy over there, that's wicked. That's, you know, if there's no judgment, the Holy Spirit's not there. Period. I mean, right there. But now it says, verse 13 there, uh, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. It doesn't say a seminary, by the way. The Holy Spirit is the one that can, that will bring you the truth. And you can go to seminary for eight years and you can get every. 8, 20, 30 years and get every degree that they offer and still come out not knowing the truth. And that happens <laughs> quite a bit. There are a lot of PhDs and THDs and everything going around this country that don't know what they're talking about. And a lot of little kids that know more scripture than they do, than the doctors of the law. <laughs> Why? Because they believe the book that they're holding in their hands. And a lot of the PhDs and THDs don't. They question it. They cut down the Word of God. And God won't reveal things to them. Okay? So, the Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, when He comes, He will be the one that guides you into the truth. And if you're not right with the Lord, you're going to be deceived. Okay? And that, by the way, is a true manifestation of, you know, again, you're going to have Christians with the three things there, reproof of sin, righteousness, judgment, but you're also going to have a true born-again Christian will readily accept the truth when the truth is founded on the scriptures. And that's another way you can tell a true convert is their attitude towards the truth. If they reject it and don't want to hear it, you can quench the spirit. I understand that. There are Christians that can quench the spirit. I'm not saying because you know you have to believe exactly as we believe or else you're lost. No, I'm not saying that. There are some Christians that they're just not right with the Lord. They're saved. But they're quenching the Holy Spirit. Okay. But there should be some love of the truth there. And when you have these people who profess Christ, but yet there's total rejection of the truth, I'm sorry, I just don't think that they're saved. Okay, but now I'll go back to Second Thessalonians chapter two. And we're going to look at this strong delusion that we read about earlier. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth. Okay, what is this strong delusion? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Okay, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay, the strong delusion that comes is the Antichrist, the fake Christ. And for these, it just, it's, it's so upsetting to me to hear a lot of these modern Christian, quote unquote, Christian leaders. Tony Campalo is a good example. Uh, Brother Greg Miller has a really good sermon on that, on Sermon Audio, on Tony Campalo. And he is saying that there is no pre tribulation rapture and the next big event is. Jesus Christ showing up. So you're going to have 
the followers that are deceived by that false prophet, that wolf in sheep's clothing, they're not looking for the rapture. They're looking for the Christ to show up. And guess who they're going to accept? The Antichrist. And they're going to think that he's Jesus Christ. Oh, he's come and he's brought the millennial kingdom. We made it through the tribulation. You know, <laughs> That's what they're going to think. God sends them strong delusion. Okay, They didn't receive a love of the truth. They didn't receive a love of this book and understanding of this book. They stayed under the ministry of a false prophet. Okay, So God's going to send them that strong delusion. Oh, you want to see Christ show up? You want your world peace and things without judgment, without reproof of sin? Okay, here you go. You don't want the truth? I'll send you the lie. God will oblige them. <laughs> okay, but it says there in verse 3, Two things. The day that that uh, it's talking about there, of course, the day of Christ is at hand, verse 2. But it says that this will not happen until there come a falling away first. And that does not mean, you know, some people try to make it the rapture. It's not the rapture. It's an apostasy. And we are in that right now. Okay, you're seeing a falling away. So many Christians that used to stand for the real, true fundamentals of the faith have fallen away. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Okay? So, this day of Christ will not happen until the apostasy happens. Right now we're in it. And then uh, the man of sin is revealed. Well, what's keeping the man of sin from being revealed? Look at verse 7. <coughs> it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Uh, I covered this in a lot more detail in the sermon, um, when will the rapture happen? So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail here, but letting there means hindering. Okay, stopping, hindering is what that means. So what is stopping the Antichrist? Well, the he who now letteth there, I believe, is the body of Christ. I don't believe it's the Holy Spirit, okay, because the Holy Spirit will be here in the tribulation. Uh, the two witnesses, the 144,000 sealed Jews, they definitely will have the Holy Spirit. But the body of Christ is the thing that's stopping the Antichrist from showing up. And of course, more on that in other studies, when the body of Christ is taken up into heaven, you see Jesus Christ opening the seal and the Antichrist is loosed. Okay, That's when that's going to happen. But the Antichrist can't be loosed until we're with the Lord. So, um, but it says here, verse 8, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And then it goes on to talk about God sending them this strong delusion, which I believe is, the subject is there, the man of sin. <coughs> now I want to look at something interesting here. Uh, just, I want to play something that uh, actually I got off of the internet. And this is kind of an interesting thing with the rapture. Um, a lot of people, myself included, I used to think that the rapture was kind of a secret thing, that only Christians knew about it, and nobody else knew it. But uh, the reality of it is, a lot of the New Agers, uh, without going into a big description here, there's they a lot of the New Agers... There's um, Elizabeth Clare Prophet is one of the more well-known ones. She died a couple of years ago. But she had a church called the Church of the Universal and Triumphant. And she claimed to have conversations with what she called ascended masters. They were devils is what they were. And these devils revealed to her that the age of Aquarius, we're in the age of Pisces right now according to the New Age, and the age of Aquarius was coming in which man would go from being homo sapien to homo noeticus, which means God-man, new man, God-man. And people would become gods, <laughs> which is really kind of funny because it's like, just read a Bible, you know. I mean, Genesis chapter 3, you can be as gods, knowing good and evil, you know. It's, it's so simple to figure that thing out. Satan's used the same lie over and over again, and the stupid New Agers, they don't read the Bible, so they can't know that. But... This age of Aquarius, there's something stopping the age of Aquarius. 
according to New Age doctrine. You can study the thing. I don't recommend studying it too much because uh, it can mess you up. You know, but they teach that the age of Aquarius cannot happen until the negative energy is removed off of the earth. And guess what the negative energy is? <laughs> Bible-believing Christians. And here's a, here's a guy on YouTube that actually, well, he has a pretty interesting thing to say here, so we'll listen to this quick. He brings up something else interesting, which we're going to cover. Old Souls, Part 2. This, what I'm going to share today, is a little exploration on the New Age and some of the, the teachings and some of the understandings that seem to be implicit here. About 20 years ago, maybe a little more, I lived in Minneapolis, and at that time, there was a public service channel on TV. And one particular day, my wife and I were watching it, and we saw a program that I found very interesting. It left an impression on me that has lasted even until this day. And that program was called The Star Connection. The Star Connection featured New Age personalities and New Age topics. On this particular day, there was a trance channeler, and uh, speaking as an enlightened alien being. What I found interesting, not just in her manner of presentation, because she was obviously not speaking of herself, but another was speaking through her, she was describing how the, the world was at a point in its evolution, and the people were at a point in their evolution, that it was ready to be trans transmuted, evolved into its newest, most enlightened state. Those things that were talked about as the Aquarian Age, the Age of Aquarius, the enlightened, hyper-understanding, compassion and altruism throughout the entire human race. But what she said as she sat there in her chair and moved her thumbs like this, speaking for this, this um, oversoul that was kind of watching from another planet, uh, was that until a certain group from this world had to be removed because they were hindering the enlightenment of the planet. So I would call this the star connection. What does that have to do with old souls? Well, first of all, it's commonly understood among New Agers and, and the occultists that there is a, uh, a race, advanced beings, and these are... Um, shall we say, the guardians of the universe, the guardians of wisdom and uh, divine inspiration and revelation. Well, these advanced beings have been saying that, oh, let me continue with what this uh, star channeler was, was sharing. She said, the day will come when this group that is so backward and so stuck in their traditions and so unyielding and so judgmental Amen. had to be removed. <laughs> so, when they're removed, then the age of enlightenment can progress. It can uh, come in due, due course. She said that they will be removed uh, through the, the help of alien space beings. And she said that they would zap these people and remove them from the earth and put them in another place where they could evolve in their own little space without <laughs> doing harm to the to the planet. So <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> and that the guy that did that report there, I think he's a Christian. I looked at his channel, you know, and, and he had some stuff on there about how to be saved, you know, and he was talking about sin and, and, and all. He's a little kooky. You know some of his beliefs and whatnot, but uh, I do think he's saved. But <clears throat> these new agers will talk about space aliens talking with them and these ascended masters and everything. All it is is they're just devils that are talking to these people, and they're calling you know, oh, I'm from outer space or something. No, they're not. They're just deceiving the people because if they come and they say, hello, I'm a devil, you know, oh, that's scary. 
But if they come and say, I'm Zular from the planet Zebulon or something like this, ooh, that's neat. You know, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, I'm talking to this alien. <laughs> but the point is, I believe that this thing of these demons, basically, the correct word is devils there. That's the, the real translation of the word. But these devils are going to play a part in the rapture scenario because they're the ones that are going to deceive the people after the rapture hits. Okay, we're going to look at that in just a little bit more detail here in a minute, but before we get into that, I was actually on uh, the one New Age website, and I was actually on the uh, Church of the Universal Triumphants website. I'm going to read that in just a minute here, but this New Ager has a whole article, and it's entitled, uh, The Christian Religion Must Change or Perish. And... Um, it says uh, they talk about this awareness. You know, they're always this awareness, this awareness, and it's you know they're speaking with these uh, devils basically. And it says this awareness indicates that the Christian religion will undergo great changes in the coming century. This was actually written in the 20th century, you know, late 1990s. So the coming century. Uh, it must make adjustments. It must change in order to survive. It must adopt beliefs, understanding which science is discovering. You know, beware of oppositions of science, falsely so-called. Global warming, evolution theory, science falsely so-called. And it says it cannot survive on the old concepts of 2,000 years ago. Um, then it gets into a lot of different things, and it talks about UFOs and conspiracies, and again, this is all satanic deception. This is what will be used to explain away the rapture. Okay. Um, let's see here. And of course they say that Satan is, is a being, is, is just, he's not real. He's not a person. He was just created by the Christians. You know, to they blame everything on him and stuff. But it says here, about Christianity, about our beliefs, it says, this awareness indicates that it has provided this, that this earth... Excuse me, let me start over. This awareness indicates that it has provided that this energy be removed from the earth plane and that it is in the process of being removed. Okay? In other words, they don't really know the day or the hour. They don't know when the rapture is going to hit. They just know it's going to hit. The devils know. Okay? If you could talk to a devil, and I don't recommend doing it, but if you could, they would know the Bible very well. Okay? They know. Okay, that you wouldn't get a devil to to say that he believes in a post tribulation rapture. <laughs> they know what's coming, and they're getting ready for it. They're gearing up for it, and the people that they communicate with, they know about the rapture too. But it's interesting. Part of the belief system is that they say that Christians are going to have to be taken off and purified by the violet flame, <laughs> which is again a new age teaching. It's this thing that this violet flame can get rid of negativity bad karma and things like this. But I, I found this so interesting. I mean, this was on the Church of the Universal and Triumphant's website, and it says here that you're to imagine this violet flame that can get rid of negative things, you know, like sin. <laughs> you know, of course it can't, but and they don't say sin. But it says uh, that you're to imagine this, this flame in your mind. Then see yourself stepping into the flame so the violet flame is where you physically are. See your body as transparent with the flames curling up from beneath your feet, passing through and around your body. And it goes on and on. That's hell. Think about that. If it's a sulfur, you know, fire and brimstone, brimstone being sulfur, that sulfur, when it's burned, puts off kind of a purplish to clear flame. They're getting these people to imagine that they're in hell. And they're too dumb to realize it. And it's the devils that are channeling this stuff to these people. You know? It's it's just incredible how deceived these poor New Agers are. Just amazing to me. And they have these chants that you're supposed to do. And here's the one. It says, I am the violet flame. And it's I, cap, capital I, capital A, capital M. So, again, you go back to the thing of I am God. Ye can be as gods. I am, I am, I am, it says here. I am, I am, I am. I am the light of God, shining every hour. Yeah, uh-huh. 
But that's the kind of stuff that the New Agers believe. Now, how does this relate to the Bible? Okay, well, as we've stated, the rapture will happen before the tribulation, and there's going to have to be a description. What, what happened? Okay, now, now what are they going to say after the rapture here on the earth? Well, some of this obviously is just conjecture on my part because I can't really tell you exactly what's going to happen. But I'm going to give you some, some of my beliefs of what they're going to do after the rapture to try and explain this thing away. If you're listening to this message and you're not saved, if you're a false convert or whatever, these are the things that you're going to have to look for. Okay, number one, there will be a lot of professing Christians who find themselves left behind. Okay, and many church leaders as well. So they're going to be trying to comfort you and, and stuff, and, and oh, it wasn't the rapture. No, no, no. It wasn't the rapture. Okay, and number two, something will, take, something will have to be done about the Internet to stop people from finding out that this event was the real rapture. And here's where it's interesting. I have here an article, February 16th of 2009, New York Times, John Markoff. Is, is the guy that wrote the article. And it says here um, that the, they're basically calling, he's saying that we need Internet 2. And what is this? He's talking about the viruses and all kinds of things that are on the current Internet, and he says the only way to fix the problem is to start over. What a new Internet might look like is still widely debated, but one alternative would, in effect, create a gated community where users would give up their anonymity Anonymity? Anonymity. There's a word I'm looking for. Thank you. Yeah. And certain freedoms in return for safety. <laughs> Look out for that. But you see, they're talking about Internet, too. And you know what's interesting? I recently heard a guy, a researcher, said that this thing could hit in as little as three to four months. That they destroy the old Internet and bring in a new Internet. Now, you see, all these sermons that we have on Sermon Audio all the thousands of good sermons on, on the Internet that anybody can access for free, and all the videos on YouTube and all the Christian websites that could tell people what happened at the rapture, it could be wiped out like that. Boom. We, we can't go with the old Internet anymore, especially now that this thing happened. We're not really sure what it was. We don't want disinformation coming out, so delete. All information for the rapture, wiped out, except for written material which probably will become hate literature, and they'll burn that too. So you're going to see a lot of changes after the rapture, and that's probably going to be one of them. Number three, the sons of God will return and profess to be space aliens, you know, more than likely. And, of course, they're devils and fallen angels. But uh, it's kind of interesting because I've heard a lot of Christians try to claim that there's going to be a fake rapture and a UFO invasion and stuff like this, and this will be this fake, fake rapture. And you say, okay, where's your source for that? And they'll point to the occult. You know? And they try to say that this fake rapture is going to deceive Christians, and only the true Christians will know. Well, that's kind of a weird way of thinking, isn't it? You know? And where's it, where's it say in the Bible that there's going to be a fake rapture and, and the true Christians are going to be deceived and things like that? And I heard a guy... <coughs> actually talk about this passage passage in second Thessalonians chapter two and he says about you know the ones that uh, the Christians that are deceived by the fake rapture that they're the ones that don't receive the love of the truth and all this it's nonsense don't believe in that <clears throat> but now number four what will happen after the rapture the Antichrist will come <clears throat> and offer the ultimate solution for world peace which of course is going to be to kill anybody that opposes him now, if the Antichrist shows up and he shows up as Jesus Christ and deceives people into thinking that he's Jesus Christ, those that follow him are going to be the ultimate fanatics. And they will kill anybody. They'll kill them with their bare hands because they think that Jesus Christ is here literally, physically on the earth. And it's the Antichrist that they're worshiping. Okay, number five. Oh, by the way, I just want to cover something here quickly. Uh, we're not going to go over the verses, but Revelation 6, 1 through 2 says that the Antichrist 
comes forth as a conqueror, not as a peace person. And there's a teaching that the first three and a half years of the tribulation is going to be peace. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. I really don't. The Antichrist comes, he's a conqueror. Okay, that's important to remember that. <clears throat> and back in Daniel chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, it says about the Antichrist being, by peace he shall destroy many. You know, he's going to be very, very violent. And by the way, that's really the way that the only way that you can bring all nations together and have quote unquote world peace is through war. You're never going to get everybody to agree. And you say, well, when Jesus Christ comes back, it, no. When Jesus Christ comes back, he brings war. Okay? It's not going to be everybody sitting down in the millennial, millennial kingdom and, okay, let's talk out our differences. No. It's going to be Jesus Christ ruling and reigning with a rod of iron for a thousand years. And he will smite the nations with that rod of iron. It's going to be military dictatorship. Jesus Christ is the head of it. Amen. There's not going to be any... Well, you can worship the way you want to worship and all paths lead to God. No. Well, all paths will lead to Jerusalem. So that's, I guess in that sense, all paths will lead to God. But he's going to be ruling there and we will be ruling and reigning with him. And there isn't going to be any voting or any, you know, whatever. Jesus Christ will say, this is the way it's going to be. Boom. Carry it out. Yes, sir. It's going to be wonderful. Um, number five. I think things are going to be so chaotic after the rapture uh, that when the Antichrist shows up, people are going to be looking for change. Daniel 7.25 talks about the Antichrist changing times and laws. Okay, He's going to change a lot of things. And of course he can do it because of the chaos of the rapture and the sons of God appearing and everything else. It's going to be very horrible. And uh, number six, the Antichrist will set himself up as God. Okay, he will. It's not as a god. He sets himself up as God, in the temple of God. So you're going to have people worshiping who they think is God, you know, manifest in the flesh. Okay, now finally turn to Revelation 22. This is where we're going to end it. Revelation 22. Verse 20 and 21. Before I read that, though, I want to just talk about the hymn that we sang this morning. Jesus is coming again. Now I'm going to read the last uh, verse of it here. It says, Standing before him at last, trial and trouble all past, crowns at his feet we will cast. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again. Maybe morning, maybe noon, maybe evening, and maybe soon. Coming again, coming again. Oh, what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. You know, and that's a very, very strong point right there. You know, a lot of people, I've gotten into debates with people now a lot over the internet, and they say, oh, you're just afraid of persecution. You're afraid, you know, you don't want to suffer for Jesus and stuff like that. That's why you're saying you want to get out of the tribulation. Well, let me ask you a question if you believe that way. Why don't you want to see Jesus? I mean, are you not anxious to meet him face to face? We should be. I mean, I'm anxious for the rapture. Yeah, I don't want to go through trials and tribulations and stuff like that and through seven years of God's wrath. No, I don't want to go through that. But more than that, I want to see Jesus. You know, I believe in him. I totally believe in him. But Lord haste the day when my faith shall be sight. And I actually, you know, you don't think about that much. But think about actually looking into his eyes. Seeing him face to face for the very first time. Why wouldn't you want that to be today? Something wrong with you? You know? Something wrong with your walk with the Lord that you don't want to meet Jesus right now? Well, I want to go through seven years of, of hell on earth, you know, first. And then, then maybe, you know, after that. Yeah, you know, I can prove how good I am. Uh huh. No, I want to see Jesus Christ today. And it says here, verse 20, Revelation 22, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. A moment in the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And that's it for this morning. Um, 
I do believe that the rapture is going to happen very soon. I'm not going to set a date for it. Don't get excited. But I do believe it's going to happen soon. The whole thing is shaping up quickly. You don't have much time left. If you're not saved, get saved. You know, examine yourself. Make sure that you are saved. Make sure that you have repented. Make sure that you are concerned about sin and righteousness and true judgment. Make sure of that stuff. If you're not saved, get saved. If you are saved, you don't have much longer to run the race that's set before you. Run it. Get something done for the Lord. Leave something here for tribulation, people into the tribulation to remember you by. Okay? It shouldn't be a thing where you get taken and they go, huh, I didn't know that so-and-so was one of them. Boy, could have, you could have fooled me. I never knew that they were saved. I never knew that they were a Christian. No, it should be when the rapture hits, your neighbors, your friends, your family should say, yeah, I know why they left. They were a King James Bible believing Christian. They didn't. They were small. They weren't real popular. But man, they stuck to that Bible. They would not compromise. They didn't care what it cost them. I know why they left. They were saved and that's why they left. That should be your desire in your heart. So that's it for this morning. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.